During our last video, we were talking about the types of chemical bonds that you find uh, between atoms, and we talked about covalent bonds where electrons are shared between two atoms. We talked about ionic bonds where electrons are stripped from one atom and pulled to another, producing two anions, sorry, two ions, an anion and a cation. And then our last type of chemical bond is a hydrogen bond. Uh, so a hydrogen bond is actually an attraction between two molecules. So to start our discussion on hydrogen bonding, let's review polar covalent bonds. So a polar covalent bond is a bond where one electronegative atom pulls electrons towards itself from its covalently bonded partner. So these bonds are a shared, um, uh, sharing electrons between the two of them. And in the case of water, oxygen is pulling electrons very strongly towards itself and away from hydrogen. So that produces these uh, partial negative and partial positive regions. So this little symbol here just uh, means partial. It means this region of this molecule here has a slightly negative charge, whereas the other side, the hydrogen side of this molecule, has a slightly positive charge. So remember that oxygen has uh, two unpaired electrons in its uh, outer shell. Hydrogen has one unpaired electron in its single shell, and so it will share those electrons with oxygen. Oxygen likes to form two bonds, um, and will often uh, form bonds with hydrogen or with itself. So hydrogen bonds are a weak type of chemical bond, um, but they're a really important chemical bond. Um, they're kind of similar to an ionic bond, um, in the sense that it's not a physical bond, but it's an attraction. So polar bonds are really central to our discussion on the chemistry of life. And that's because water molecules form uh, these hydrogen bonds. And remember that water is incredibly important in living organisms. Uh, living organisms are mainly made up of water. Uh, there's so much water on Earth. Organisms live in water. Um, there's water in our atmosphere. So the properties of water that we get from these polar water molecules are really important. And because they're polar, they perform uh, hydrogen bonds. Um, in a hydrogen bond, you usually have hydrogen bonded to oxygen or nitrogen. Uh, we're going to focus on water here, but if you look down that molecule at the bottom, ammonia, you see that you have nitrogen bonded to three hydrogens. Nitrogen is very electronegative, just like oxygen, and it pulls electrons toward itself, producing that partial negative so in hydrogen bonding, we actually have an attraction between the partially charged hydrogen region of one molecule and the partially charged negative region of another molecule. So in this case, we have um, that positive hydrogen on the water being attracted to that negative charge on the nitrogen. On the right hand side, we have water molecules. So this is a group of five water molecules with a central water molecule and hydrogen bonding to four other molecules. And you can see it's just alternating positive to negative attractions. So hydrogen bonding gives water some of its very special properties. And water has um, a set of five major properties that give it some very specific characteristics that are vitally important to living organisms. So we've seen this water molecule quite a few times. A uh, general characteristic is that it is uh, V-shaped. We get our uh, hydrogens on one side and our um, oxygen on the other, and that has to do with uh, some chemistry of the electrons uh, that are uh, in pairs on the other side of that hydrogen. We're not really going to worry about that too much. But water is a, a strongly uh, polar molecule and uh, likes to be uh, associated with other water molecules. 
So here's a quick video showing uh, water and uh, its polarity. The atoms that make up a water molecule are in a constant tug of war over their shared electrons. Oxygen exerts a far stronger pull on the shared electrons than does hydrogen, and so the electrons spend more of their time closer to the oxygen atom. Because of this unequal sharing of electrons, the oxygen atom in a water molecule actually has a slight negative charge, and each hydrogen atom has a slight positive charge, even though the water molecule as a whole is neutral. Because of the unequal sharing of electrons and the resulting positive and negative poles, a water molecule is said to be polar. The polarity of water molecules causes them to be attractive to each other. Since the positively charged atom involved in this special type of attraction is always a hydrogen atom, this kind of bond between molecules is called a hydrogen bond. Each water molecule can hydrogen bond to four other water molecules. A hydrogen bond is weak and lasts only a tiny fraction of a second, but it takes a lot of energy to overcome the combined attraction of many hydrogen bonds. This explains water's great capacity to store heat, its high boiling point, surface tension, and several other unusual properties. So this video touched on a really key uh, aspect of hydrogen bonding, and that is that hydrogen bonds are individually weak. They form and reform constantly. But a collection of hydrogen bonds is strong because it forms this network um, of a huge number of hydrogen bonds that uh, at any one time, the majority are uh, essentially bonded together. So each water molecule is surrounded by four others in this sort of net of water molecules, this net attraction that brings them all together. So from this polar water molecule and all of this hydrogen bonding, we get a set of properties called the emergent properties of water. So remember emergent properties. When you organize something in a new way, you get new properties or new characteristics. Um, and water is absolutely no different. Um, again, we get this network of water, this special organization of water and hydrogen bonds that gives uh, water uh, a strength to it. And that strength, uh, that attraction is really important for living organisms. So our first property is what we call cohesion of water molecules. So cohesion is um, an attraction between two like substances. Um, and in this case, cohesion of water is just water molecules attracted to themselves. Um, and so we get uh, water molecules uh, sort of linked. Um, they're attracted to each other because of their charges. And again, they form this huge network. Um, Related to cohesion is the idea of adhesion. So adhesion is when uh, one substance, substance clings to another. So in this uh, example here, we'll talk about in a minute, we have water clinging to another substance. Uh, there are a lot of reasons that cohesion and adhesion are really important, but one of the biggest is that uh, these two properties together allow water to move against gravity up trees, uh, and other plants. And so if you think about uh, a tree that might be 20, 30 feet tall, um, water shouldn't move up. Water should be pulled down against gravity. Uh, but moving water up to the leaves in the top of the tree is vitally important for the process of photosynthesis. And this occurs because of cohesion and adhesion. So we have these special type of cells inside the tree trunk there, and they're long tube cells that conduct water up them. And the reason that water is able to move up these tubes and against gravity uh, has to do with cohesion and adhesion. So at the very top of that tree up there, uh, those leaves open up uh, little pores called stomata, and on a hot day, water escapes out those stomata. Uh, when that happens, when one water molecule leaves the plant, uh, it pulls the next one 
down the chain along with it because remember they're attracted to each other so there's essentially a chain of water molecules going down this plant um, and they'll be pulled up as one evaporates the next one is pulled and when that one evaporates the next is pulled and the one below is pulled higher and so on all the way down uh, to help uh, with this movement against gravity we also have adhesion working so uh, on the right hand side there we have these water molecules uh, in a cartoon uh, diagram showing them moving up some of these water conducting cells and you can see that they have drawn the cohesion the attraction between the water molecules but we also have adhesion so not only are the water molecules potentially attracted to themselves they're also attracted to the sides the walls of these cells uh, that are helping the water move up. So you have these forces that are working against gravity. Cohesion also gives us a property of surface tension. So surface tension is just the measure of uh, the strength of the surface of the water. It's um, how much uh, energy or weight is required to break the bonds between the water molecules. Remember, their individual hydrogen bonds are individually weak, but as a group, really strong. So we've got this little water strider spider here uh, standing on the water. And um, the reason that he's able to do this has to do with um, his weight and how it's distributed on the water, but it is able to uh, stay supported in the water because hydrogen bonds are holding those water molecules together. And so the weight of that spider is not strong enough to break those hydrogen bonds. Um, this is just kind of a cool example, but surface tension is actually really important. Um, if you're a fish under that water, uh, you're relying on bugs and um, other things right on the surface of the water. Um, you, if you're a plant, you might spread your pollen and it can float on the water. Um, so it really allows some um, important aspects of an aquatic ecosystem um, to stay suspended in the water or on top of the water and not to sink all the way to the bottom. So our next property of water is moderation of temperature by water. Um, so this means that uh, water actually acts as sort of an insulator uh, for itself and for the environment. Um, so when we talk about heat, um, heat will pass from the warmer object to the cooler object. So your warmer object loses heat, whereas the cooler object is going to heat up. So one thing that um, the hydrogen bonds in water give water is something called a high specific heat. And we'll define that in just a minute. Um, and the if we think about heat, um, we are basically putting energy into something. Um, that energy can be measured in something called a calorie. And it takes uh, or I'm sorry, a calorie is uh, defined as the amount of heat it takes to raise one, sorry, the, let me back up. A calorie is defined as the amount of heat it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Um, so if you think about uh, a small glass of water, it doesn't take too much heat to warm it up. But if you think about something like the ocean, it's gonna take a lot of heat to raise the temperature of an ocean or a large lake. So water has what we call a high specific heat. Um, specific heat is just the amount of heat uh, that you have to uh, add, the, um, the amount of calories that you have to add to raise the temperature of the water. And waters is really, really high. Uh, you'll just have to believe me on that for right now. Uh, water has a very high specific heat. That means that it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of the water. And the reason that it takes so much energy to change the temperature of water is because of those hydrogen bonds. Remember, they're attracted to each other. They want to stay attracted to each other, and they're not going to be pulled apart very easily. 
When you start adding heat to water though, you start moving those hydrogen bonds, you start moving uh, the water molecules, and uh, they become less and less attracted to each other because they're moving, they're not stopping to be attracted to each other. Uh, and so you, as you increase the amount of energy you put in, you uh, increase the movement of those water molecules. And so you are uh, putting energy in and that movement and that energy is heating the water up. Eventually, uh, when you get really, really hot, you've provided enough energy for those water molecules to evaporate off. Um, but this is really important for our planet and it's really important for organisms in local ecosystems because large bodies of water are going to moderate the temperature around them. Um, they're going to moderate the temperature on the shore around and water itself is going to uh, be limited in how far uh, the temperature is going to raise or lower over a 24-hour period. And so even in hot temperatures, you don't get huge swings in uh, the range of temperatures of, of the water. And this is important for living organisms because they're not going to be able to tolerate huge changes in water temperatures over a short, short amount of time. So this map here shows Southern California. You can see Los Angeles there about halfway up the coastline. We've got the Pacific Ocean. Um, and then we've got several cities in Southern California. Just as a little side note, I am from San Bernardino. We have those wonderful, lovely 100 degree summers. Um, anyway, uh, this is a really good example of how water moderates temperature. Um, so we've got this huge Pacific Ocean that can absorb a vast amount of heat uh, without the temperature changing very much. Because remember, when you add heat, it uh, wa uh, causes water molecules to move more quickly. But there are a lot of water molecules in that Pacific Ocean, even just on the surface. Um, so your uh, ocean can absorb large quantities of water and it absorbs heat from the air around it. Um, and so it can absorb heat uh, from the air around it and limit not only the temperature swings in the water but also temperature swings uh, in the land around it. So this is your average temperature uh, shown along the coast uh, in the 70s. Um, and that temperature is basically stays pretty steady uh, throughout the day. There's not huge swings in temperatures uh, along the coastline there. But then as you move farther inland, we see Santa Ana's a little warmer, Riverside's a little warmer than that, San Bernardino's even warmer, um, and then you start to get out Palm Springs, that area out there is all desert. Um, and you get much larger swings in the temperature there. The days are really hot, uh, the nights cool off quite a bit, sometimes as much as 20 to 30 degrees. And that's because you don't have that heat energy being absorbed by the ocean. Um, you have uh, the sun going down and everything cooling off and then the sun coming up and everything getting hot again. But out there on the coast, um, all that warm air that you, all the, the warmth in the air that heats up during the day gets absorbed by that ocean um, and keeps the temperature much more steady. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and so the same thing happens uh, around the Great Lakes, around um, other oceans, um, even just larger lakes. You can have the local effects of this as well. Uh, moderation of temperature by water um, also includes evaporative cooling. So this is something that happens uh, in organisms um, and it is related to uh, your water molecules heating up from the surrounding environment and then uh, basically becoming steam and leaving. Uh, so when your water molecules are heated up, uh, say uh, on your skin you start to sweat on a hot day and uh, those water molecules are heated up by the environment or by your skin um, they start to move fast and eventually they move fast enough to break away and when they break away they take the heat with them um, and so when you uh, sweat and then um, 
the water molecules evaporate off your skin that uh, actually takes the heat and leaves your skin feeling cooler. Um, so this uh, evaporative cooling happens a lot in mammals that sweat. Um, other organisms like dogs don't sweat, uh, but they pant, and that's a form of evaporative cooling. Uh, the, they stick out their tongues and their uh, water molecules evaporate off their tongues and then as they're panting as they're doing that motion it's blowing those hot air that th sorry those hot molecules away um, leaving the dog feeling cooler so our third property of water is a really interesting one um, and this is that ice floats on liquid water so water is unique in that the solid form of it actually floats. Normally, uh, when you have a liquid, the solid form is more dense um, and sinks in its own liquid. But ice actually floats on water. Um, and this is kind of a strange property. Uh, the behavior of water changes depending on the temperature. So when it's really hot, it's steam. Steam is a little bit irrelevant here at the moment. Um, and then uh, cools down, becomes liquid water. Uh, we all are familiar with liquid water. But water is actually its most dense at 4 degrees Celsius, uh, which is a little bit strange because in theory it should be most dense at its solid, which would be 0 degrees. Um, but it's really not. Um, at 0 degrees, ice is less dense, um, and below 0, uh, ice is less dense than water, and so it floats on top. So this goes back to hydrogen bonding, that V V shape of our water molecules. Um, and remember, those water molecules form this uh, net um, based on hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen bonds form a very specific angle. And the same thing happens when those water molecules begin to slow down. They slow down because they're getting colder. Um, they have less energy and they begin to fit into this uh, special lattice shape. So if you look at this picture on the side, we've got our red oxygen molecules and then our blue hydrogen molecules and they are all they have all formed this excuse me this specific shape um, called a crystal lattice and the crystal lattice is important because it leaves space in between the water molecules um, so you can kind of sort of think of this as like a honeycomb shape with air in the middle. There's not actually air in between those molecules, but there is space in between those molecules, and that makes it less dense. That's what allows ice to float on water uh, in, the, in your glass. Um, and it's also really important for living organisms because it allows ice to float on water, um, large lakes and things like that. So you get your uh, water molecule slowing down as the environment cools off, they start to form this crystal lattice, the ice floats on top. And this is not only the ice floating on water property, but it's also water uh, moderation of temperature by water. So when the ice floats on top of a pond or a lake, um, it actually moderates the temperature underneath. That limits the fluctuation of the water temperatures in the winter, so the water underneath doesn't get quite so cold, and so that allows living organisms to stay in very cold environments, um, aquatic organisms that is, to stay in those water environments without freezing. If ice were more dense than its liquid, it would sink to the bottom and uh, our ponds and lakes would freeze from the bottom up. So they would kill everything every winter um, because they would be freezing uh, and removing that habitat, freezing the organisms within the ice. So our next property is water as a solvent. Uh, so a solvent is uh, something that dissolves something else. Um, so basically, water uh, does a really good job at making solutions. So a solution is where you have uh, something dissolved uh, in a liquid. So we've got a few definitions here. A solute is whatever is being dissolved. The solvent is the substance that does the dissolving. Uh, 
Um, and we are specifically talking about water. So this is called an aqueous solution. When you dissolve something in water, it's an aqueous solution. And here our example is sodium chloride again. So remember we looked at sodium chloride as an example of an ionic bond. And we said that chlorine uh, strips electrons away from sodium, leaving sodium with a positive charge and chlorine with a negative charge. Now if you remember back to our water molecule, we've got our polar water molecule with the partial negative end and the partial positive end. And so the way that water dissolves the sodium chloride is that it surrounds the um, molecule, uh, one chlorine, one sodium, um, based on charge attraction. So the hydrogen, positive hard hydrogen end is attracted to the negative chlorine, uh, and then the negative oxygen end is attracted to that positive sodium. So we get what's called a hydration shell. And this is just water molecules that surround the sodium and the chloride and uh, disrupt their lattice system so that they can't interact with each other. And this is really important for living organisms because cells are made mostly of water. And so uh, anything that you have in the cell is going to come in contact with water. And so depending on what it is, it's going to either be polar or nonpolar, and it's going to interact with water in very specific ways uh, depending on what they are. Or, I'm sorry, very specific ways depending on what the molecule is. So I actually already got ahead of myself and talked about this slide. Um, this is the same picture. So this leads us to two different properties um, of polar and nonpolar molecules. So a nonpolar molecule um, is not going to have any of those partial charges. Remember, the electrons are shared equally. Nothing gets a charge. Um, and that uh, lack of charge causes it to behave very differently than we saw with that sodium and chloride uh, with their positive and negative charges. So we have two different types of substances named based on how they interact with water. Hydrophilic substances or water-loving substances interact very nicely. They're usually charged substances um, either uh, polar and partially charged or uh, fully charged because they are an acid or a base, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, they usually contain a lot of oxygen, a lot of hydrogen, a lot of nitrogen, and they mix well with water. And then we have uh, hydrophilic substances or water-fearing substances, and these are things that don't interact well with water. They're generally uncharged substances, um, sometimes nonpolar, and so um, they have no attraction to water. Water will actually exclude these substances because they are attracted more strongly to themselves. So uh, oil is a really good example of a hydrophobic substance. If you put some oil on top of a glass of water, um, that oil is going to stay on top because water is attracted to itself. Um, it excludes the oil. It doesn't interact with the oil. So finally we get to our last topic. Our last topic is acids and bases. And acids and bases are not really uh, properties of water so much as um, kind of a way that water behaves. It, it is uh, very much associated though with the properties of water um, and also our hydrophilic hydrophobic substances. So we have our two water molecules here um, and those water molecules are attracted to each other and sometimes because oxygen is so electronegative it'll actually pull a hydrogen away from another water molecule. This produces something called a hydronium ion and you can imagine that that is quite uh, charge heavy. Um, it's got a lot of electrons being pulled towards it. Um, and that hydronium ion is an oxygen and three hydrogens, but it's actually often written in shorthand as uh, H+. So it's written like there's just a free hydrogen ion, which is not really the case, but uh, that is convention. And then when that oxygen pulls away the hydrogen, it produces a hydroxide ion, uh, or the OH 
uh, over there that is negatively charged because it is missing uh, one of its hydrogens. So that hydrogen took its electron uh, with it. I'm sorry. Uh, the high yes, the hydrogen. <laughs> Uh, but oxygen is still uh, has an extra electron um, and it's still pulling that electron from the other hydrogen. So an acid is any substance that increases the hydrogen ion of a solution. So it's any substance that's going to give up uh, a hydrogen ion um, and leave free hydrogen ions uh, in solution or those hydronium ions. I remember uh, they're basically, I know they don't look like the same thing, but they are the same thing. They're considered the same thing and the hydrogen ion is just the shorthand. So I'm just going to say hydrogen ion. Acids release hydrogen ions into a solution. A base is any substance that reduces the hydrogen ion concentration in a solution. <coughs> so it is a molecule that is going to pick up hydrogen ions. Um, a base also, another definition of a base, is a substance that releases hydroxide ions, those OH molecules. Um, so a base can behave either way. It can either uh, pick up hydrogen ions or it can release hydroxide ions, uh, which will actually in turn pick up a hydrogen ion. So we measure the acidity level of a uh, solution by the pH scale. So the pH scale uh, depends on the hydrogen ion concentration. It's a measure of how much hydrogen ions there are in a solution. So remember, uh, acids uh, release hydrogen ions, uh, bases pick them up. So uh, we have our formula there for the pH scale. It's the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Really all I want you to know is that pH is dependent on the hydrogen ion concentration. Um, related to that log though, an important property of the pH scale is that it's not linear. Um, it's actually an exponential change uh, in concentration. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So as your pH decreases, as your uh, pH gets closer to 1, uh, your hydrogen ion increases. As your pH increases or gets closer to 14, your hydrogen ion decreases or your hydroxide ions increase. Um, so I'd like you to pause here and just take a minute, take some notes on this. Uh, draw it out, maybe go to the next slide and look at it, see what's going on here, and sort of get it straight. You have your uh, pH decreasing. Make sure you understand what it means to say that it decreases, the number gets smaller, but that means that your hydrogen ion concentration gets larger. So here we have an example of our pH scale. So at the top there we have a pH of zero. That's something that's extremely acidic. It's a really high number of hydrogen ions in that concentration. You can see the beaker on the left sort of demonstrates that. There's a lot of hydrogen ions, not a lot of hydroxide ions. Um, as we uh, increase just a little bit, pH of one, we get battery acid, then lemon juice, vinegar. These are all very acidic uh, things. Then we have tomato juice, black coffee. These are things that are slightly less acidic, uh, but still considered acidic. In the middle, we have our neutral pHs. So neutral pH is uh, technically seven. That's where your hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion concentrations are equal. Uh, pure water should be neutral. It should be a pH of seven. Um, and a lot of our uh, the liquids found in our bodies are going to be right around neutral. We've got uh, urine there, uh, slightly acidic at 6, um, and then we've got seawater and small intestine at 8. That's kind of the more basic side of neutral, but uh, most organisms range, or parts of their body, body in general, range between 6 and 8, uh, kind of a neutral range on pH. And then at the other end, we have our uh, increasingly basic uh, pHs where your hydroxide ions become, become uh, higher than your concentration of hydrogen ions. And we have things like ammonia, oven cleaner, um, not too many uh, 
functions in the body require basic uh, environment, uh, but there are certainly some uh, proteins and things that are basic, some molecules uh, that act as bases. Um, so talking about pH being a log scale, we look at these numbers, we see it ranges from 1 to 14. Um, and if you move from, uh, say, pH 7 to pH 6, uh, we've decreased our pH, which means we've increased our hydrogen ion concentration. You actually increase your ion concentration by tenfold. Um, so then it's another tenfold increase in ion concentration to 5. Um, so we get this exponential uh, increase or decrease in our concentrations of hydroxide or hydrogen ions. So we do have some processes within our bodies that produce hydrogen ions. We have some molecules that release them that act as acids. Um, but in general, cells have to maintain a pH of around 7. Um, and any even a slight change in the pH can be really harmful to an organism, and that's because hydrogen ions are really reactive. They want to be bonded to something else, and so they can disrupt uh, other molecules and processes in the cell. So to counteract that, um, we have what we call a buffer. So a buffer um, helps to limit swings in pH, and they do this by uh, either accepting a hydrogen ion, so decreasing the pH, decreasing the acidity, um, or maybe releasing a hydroxide ion, um, causing a solution to become more basic. And usually, uh, this is a molecule that can do either one of them. They're usually um, a mild acid or a mild base. Um, and depending on the situation, they will either donate or accept a hydrogen ion or a hydroxide ion. Um, and this is really important in our blood. Um, so our blood contains a buffer called carbonic acid. And you don't want your blood to get acidic. Um, this causes a lot of medical problems. Um, and so carbonic acid um, has the ability to uh, accept or release a hydrogen ion depending on the situation. So if your blood becomes more acidic, carbonic acid is actually going to pick up hydrogen ions in an attempt to lower that pH. Um, if your uh, body or your, um, excuse me, your blood becomes more basic, it can actually donate a hydrogen ion in order to attempt to keep that pH right around neutral. Um, so on the left hand side we have carbonic acid. Uh, those little arrows in the middle remember mean your reaction can go either way. So depending on whether or not the pH is rising or falling in the blood, um, it can either uh, release a hydrogen ion, which we have shown here on the right, um, and uh, then if the pH uh, changes the other way, it can uh, accept those hydrogen ions and go back to carbonic acid. So your blood really works uh, to sort of keep a balance uh, of uh, your hydrogen ions so that it does not become super acidic.